Hey everybody, it's Ia Patsy. I uh, just wanted to say hi, it's Sunday. And I was sitting here thinking in my room and that for some reason I started thinking about that song, Fairy Tales by uh, Anita Baker, right? And in relationship to relationships and the reason and the way that we choose our partners, um, I've spoken before about the uh, father therapy that we need, you know, some of us women, that we look for our fathers in the men that we choose in some ways. It could be looks, it could be attitude, it could be a whole number of things. And those of us who have experienced abandonment issues, we may tend to gravitate towards guys who end up being emotionally unavailable or, you know, involved in third party relationships or, you know, or even overseas, something, so, something that puts a distance between yourself and the person that you're interested in. But, you know, these are just things that I th was with was thinking about, you know, and I think about a lot, actually, um, because especially now I've been, you know, thinking about these issues in terms of myself. And I had a few interesting little uh, breadcrumbs <laughs> and epiphanies over the last week or two in regards to the way I look at... Um, men and the way I look at fatherhood <clears throat> and the way I look at fathers in general, men in general, I guess, because whatever I feel about fathers is what translates into the way I feel about men. So I take ownership of that, right? Um, and that also goes along with my uh, Lilith... <laughs> uh, kind of uh, personality in a way, you know, I have a little bit of that, quite a lot of, of that, I guess. So those two things uh, can be quite intimidating um, and also could lead to singleness, right? So, but I was sitting here and um, just thinking about it as doing a lot of thinking as I've been apt to do lately. Um thinking about my work, thinking about my life, my family, my love, my past loves, and seeing what has been consistent. So what I did was, you know, I actually like went like piece by piece, like what, who were the significant people, um, and what did they have in common? Did they have anything in common? And even if you can't, I couldn't think of it right away, it came after a while. You know, it wasn't something that I sat down and did in 20 minutes. It, it came over time, you know, uh, for some of them. Some of them, it was looks. Not that they looked like one another, but they looked my, like my father in some manner, some of them. Or... um they had a southern draw like he did. Um, he was uh, thin and tall, so there was that. Uh, a little bit of a bully, and there was that. <laughs> very, very handsome, and there was always that, and I recognized that to my demise. And I even tried to... Mm, temper it a little bit because that pretty boy thing just no because I still got Lilith <laughs> right so that no you're not gonna be in the mirror more than me brother okay I may have some uh confidence issues but it ain't helping when you think you prettier than I am <laughs> no so I was I got you know I, I learned from that fairly quickly um so I would be no problem. I would go out guys who weren't exactly like 
a heartthrob as far as looks goes, but I thought they were cute. And as long as I thought they were cute, that was good enough for me. You know, it was like, I wasn't looking for the pretty boy. I was just looking for someone that, you know, in case we got married and had children, you know, I just didn't, as we used to say, as long as he wasn't a mud duck, right? <laughs> Platypus. <laughs> Anyhow, that's terrible, but I'm just saying. These are the th- Look, I, I went to college in the 70s and in the 80s. You know, we had political correctness was not even a whisper in the back of our heads. <laughs> well, you have to give credit for, to, to those, those people around you who have adjusted and grown over time. Those who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s even, who have tried to embrace political correctness and have embraced it fully, you know, or try, try at least to embrace it as much as they can and try to understand because it was a whole different flow when we were younger, you know. Um, and, you know, let, try to just be a little uh, gentle in your thoughts towards your parents and your grandparents and your aunts and uncles and folks like that because, you know, the world was different and, and we've seen a lot of things, you know. Folks who grew up in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we've seen assassinations after assassinations after assassinations after assassinations after assassinations. After assassinations. We've seen lynchings. We've seen the space capsule explode. We we we've seen nine eleven. We've seen hostage situation of Americans overseas that lasted for years and and then was turned and used to. Uh, by an election, basically. Um, so there are those of us who know that, that those things that went on that are the backstory that you're not going to find on YouTube or you're not going to find uh, anywhere because now it'll be called a conspiracy theory. But even in those conspiracy theories, you had to live through it, you know. Um, even the, you know, uh, Clinton Lewinsky scandal. You know, it's whatever. You know, she has evolved over time. This whole situation has evolved over time. Everything that should have been said was said a long time ago. But the main thing that it should have been said is don't trust nobody, okay? You don't have friends at work in case nobody told you. That is something we can all learn from that. There are no friends at work, okay? You can have close associates, but if there's something that you know that you're doing that you should not be doing, you don't need to share that with somebody at your job. That would be, find find another friend, okay? But not something like that, especially when you're dealing in a political situation. Um, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. But, yes, that is part of the problem is she was young, you know, but... She was no angel. She was no innocent. And yes, it was inappropriate for President Clinton to have an affair. But that was something that was between he and his wife. And as far as Monica, she took responsibility for it. And, you know, even now, because of the Me Too movement, okay, so we're going to say that, well, he should have known better. You're right. But he didn't tell her to flip her thong at him in his office when he was at work. He was minding his business. You know, he didn't ask her to do that. And she volunteered that information on her own and she wrote about it in her book. So let's let's be clear here. Okay, maybe he should have known better. Right. And so the reason that you get a lot of controversy is there some people who even then at the time and still now was like, well, he's a grown man and that's nobody's business. And other people were like, no, he's a grown man and he should have known better. And he was much older than her. And other people were like, well, he was the president of the United States. So none of that should have went on at all. And all three of those things could be all true at the same time. But the majority of people at the time felt that 
that really the person that was the most injured in this entire matter was Hillary Clinton. And instead, people decided that they wanted to throw darts at her. But at the time when that was going on, let me tell you, she was so respected the way she carried herself. And all of these stories of all of these other things that were said or anything like that, I never heard Monica say that Hillary called her anything or called her and said anything to her. She may have talked about her in general before she knew that Bill was a liar, but once she found out that Bill had lied, oh my God. And then she didn't put the country through, you know, divorcing her husband. You know, while he was a sitting president. You know, she didn't try to make history like that. That would have been an easy thing to make history with. Okay? But she didn't do that. Because she was a patriot, honestly. And she put her country ahead of her needs. And she also took advice from her mother, who had experienced being an orphan when she was a little girl who worked as a housekeeper when she was a little girl. And, you know, stability, security is something that we all want. Something that we all want. And there was no guarantee at the time that when she divorced, if she would have divorced President Clinton, there was anything. They weren't rich when they came to the White House. They had always, you know, he had been a, a... the governor of Arkansas, and she was a law, an attorney. They weren't rich. And after you leave the White House, you don't get rich unless you are doing book tours and, you know, that kind of stuff. So the money t- to be made was to be made after he left the White House. So even if she had divorced him at the time, what would she have gotten? Let's be honest, if you think about it, he wasn't rich. And if she had divorced him then, she would have just been getting what half of what he had. And then once they left the White House, why? Why should she? Why should she divorce him to do what? Go marry Ned DeWino? Come on, stop. Mm-mm. She made a decision that was right for her at the time. And she's gotten broiled over the coals for it since then. That's ridiculousness. But perhaps that's my Lilith personality, my Lilith traits, whatever. Lilith aspects of, I guess, my planetary placements, actually. But, and I might lose more subscribers who listen to this, but I'm just saying, we're being, try to, let's just try to stop being, leave that alone. Stop every time something happens. We got to bring up Bill and Hillary Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Stop. Come on. Y'all can't, nobody, nobody should be saying nothing when we're looking at what we're looking at right now. Come on. And even back then. Back then, a blowjob was not sex, was not, the average person did not know that a blowjob and sex were the same thing. Honest to God. It did not become the same thing until the Bill Clinton affair. People were doing it, but they were doing, it was something you did instead of sex. Like, you know, you're going with somebody and you didn't want to have sex with them, you know, trying to remain a virgin or something like that. That's what people did. That was like avoiding sex. It wasn't until this Ken Starr investigation and everything that happened, it became, oh, that's sex too? Honest to God. And it's not just people who, you know, didn't know no better. It it was like discussed on television, sort of, kind of, sort of, of how this is something that is now added to what is considered. Because that was a discussion. Like, really? Well, they didn't have sex. Yes, they did. Really? No. And that was the discussion that went back and forth, too. But you're not going to hear all of that because you didn't live through that. Just like we don't know the details of things that happened back when George Washington was alive and 
<clears throat> you know, Thomas Jefferson, and we know little smidgens of it, but we don't know the real nitty gritty, nitty day to day living through it, just like your children are not going to even understand what was going on now. <laughs> and and neither will ours or our grandchildren. Matter of fact, our children don't understand right now when they're living through it, you know? But it's something that no one will understand until they're actually living through it and they 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 are able to feel the energy that was around at the time. Okay, because we remember there's always energy. Energy is around everything even politics, and when something is affecting a nation and everyone is talking about it and discussing it, the same thing like O.J. Simpson case, the same thing like um, any of these big cases, you know, um, that have caught the imagination, you know, of of the country and given everybody pause, you know, even during 9-11, there was an energy and everybody's like, what happened to us? We were so close after 9-11, you know, because it was an energy that rose, a vibration that rose to a certain height across the nation. And then slowly over time, it dissipated. And then that's where we are now. It's like this is the polar opposite, in a way, of where we were at that time. That's interesting. Hmm. I might have to think about that. So anyway, getting back to the subject at hand. So, if you know the lyrics to that song, and at least the first part of the song was what I was thinking about, and I just picked up this um, recording and wanted to just get this recorded. And uh, it says, I still remember stories, those tales my mother said she told me fairy tales before I went to bed and she spoke of happy endings and tucked me in real tight and turned the night light on and kissed my face goodnight and my mind was filled with visions of perfect paradise and she said that everything would be so nice that he'd ride right up and on his white horse and take me away one night and I'd be so happy with him that we'd ride clean out of sight and he never came to save me he let me stand alone, out in the wilderness, alone in the cold. And my story ends as stories do. Reality comes into view. No longer living life in paradise. Fairy tales. Right? So, those were the words, basically. Okay, and that's Anita Baker, giving credit to her. Um, she was the artist. I believe she actually was the writer, but I don't have it in front of me right now. And um, when I post this, I will find that information and put it in the description. Um, and I thought about that in relation to situations where you may have a child, boy or girl, but I can relate more to how it affects a girl, that their father isn't around for whatever reason. He don't. He doesn't know about her. He's in jail for a long period of time. He's gone and you don't know where he is. He died in the war. Anything. And those fairy tales that they told us or that we read to ourselves even for some of us because it was like that. <laughs> but they did spin stories of being happy with uh, a husband, a family, someone that's going to come and rescue you from this. And if that is what you thought, not only is it going to affect the way you look at relationships, but it also reinforces the abandonment of a father figure, if you think about it. Because if that's what you were told and you associated that Prince Charming with a father figure, maybe not consciously, but even more subconsciously than you sub uh, substituting him for a bow, 
uh, you know, a future husband, your boo, whatever, your man. But if you also, in your spirit, mm, you let that register about hoping that one day that father would come back. Or maybe it was never said, or somehow or another, maybe your mother mm, transmitted that energy to you, even if she never said it, that maybe she was hoping that he came back. Or maybe you felt she did something that caused him not to be there. And maybe that is what is affecting your mother-daughter relationship, or your uh, mother-son relationship. Maybe you blame your mother for him not coming back. Even if he was dead. Even if he left her. Even if he was in prison. Maybe somewhere in your... That same subconscious, subconscious... Registered that it was her fault somehow. Because we've been raised to believe a lot of things are mother's faults anyway... So why not blame her for that even too? So. I just thought that was something interesting that came to my mind that maybe if we recognize that the fairy tales didn't always didn't always set us up for bad relationships with love relationships. Those fairy tales set us up also for bad relationships with our mothers because or female figures around us because you know every story has a wicked stepmother and so the idea of having a stepmother definitely comes with negative connotations in other words the new parent stepmother or stepfather has to is is coming in working from a deficit already whether you're a little kid right now or you're an adult, because you have been told that the stepmother is some uh, a witch, right? Wicked stepmother steals the husband or uh, comes into the husband's life after the wife dies, and then he dies shortly thereafter and takes the entire kingdom. Hmm? It happens. Sure it does. But then there are times when it doesn't happen. There are times when men are bigamist. And so the second wife doesn't know about it and she loses everything. Or never got married to any, never got married, has been divorced, never bothered to get divorced from the first wife, never got married to the second woman at all. Because he knew he was divorced, but he never said nothing. He just put off, oh, baby, what we need, a piece of paper, all that other nonsense for. Or he just found somebody that it wasn't important to her either. And then he dies, and here comes the wife to take everything that they've owned. That he owned, that this woman thought they owned together. Oh, no, they didn't. There have been cases like that. I've seen it happen Right here where I live, twice in the time I've known. And those are the th- the ones I knew of. You know, big deals, too. And embarrassing. And astonishing. Oh, you know, you heard people go to funerals and children that they never heard of show up with wives that they nobody else knew that they had or a whole family that they had on the other side of town. And it happens. And it affects people, even adults when you get that kind of trauma, right? Because that's traumatic. But again, we put expectations on relationships. We put expectations on the men in our lives. We put expectations on our mothers, our step-parents, based on these fairy tales. There's a beauty in it, the ability to have a child's imagination 
expand and explore. But at the same time, there's something insidious going on underneath. Now, could it all be because we are being we were being programmed in a patriarchal mindset? Even the people who wrote them, not 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 saying that they were part of the um, conspiracy. He, you know, just they had the same mindset that we have. You know, a little less advanced, but the same type of mindset that, you know, men were heroes or victims, hmm, and women were. Mean, short tempered, killers, <laughs> children eaters. I mean, even in Jack the Bean in the Beanstalk, Jack's mother just had had enough, and she snatched the the beans and threw them out the window. Okay, yes, it ended up being the Beanstalk, but she lost her temper. She didn't say, oh, poor Jack, dear. What are we going to do now? She just threw him out the window, started bawling, crying, fell asleep, whatever. Jack standing there. He didn't know what he had done. Next day, there's the beanstalk that goes up so that Jack can avenge his father's death and get all of the giant's treasures to save his mama. Mm. Because now your son is your savior, too. Hmm. And this all goes back to that same, um, the Christ story, you know. Just the way this being told, not saying it was not an actual event, saying the way that it has been retold. Just like I was saying about Monica and Hillary and Bill. If you weren't there at the time, then you don't know all the nuances. You're just getting, you know, this view from 30 years later. Being reported on by people who grew up in a different generation than the generation that was actively watching this going on. Adults who are able to process all of the information who understood what was being said that the president was being accused of and could understand that this was not supposed to get to this. This was supposed to be about white water and it ends up being about a blue dress. And the reason that you all upset is because he lied about an affair that he had already told his wife didn't happen. Come on, who wouldn't have lied? Most men would have. Isn't that what Brett Kavanaugh said the other day? I've had beers. You drink beers? What kind of beers you like, sir? That kind of thing. That was the mindset of the people who were around then. In a way, you know? Very, very, very... Nuance, and of course, it went down party lines because the same people who were accusing Bill Clinton of these things ended up being doing even worse things. Newt Gangris, the wife that he's with now, was his secretary, and he went to his wife's hospital bed and served the divorce papers. Surprise! Surprise divorce papers after he had done what he did to Bill Clinton. And then there was another one who was the. Uh, House of Representatives after him that did somewhat the same thing and had to step down. Oh, they were all out of control. And the only person that got in trouble was Bill Clinton. Everybody else skated back and now they're on TV talking shit about Bill Clinton. It's amazing. It's amazing. And people have such short memories, you know. The American people have short memories and that's what these people count on. Okay, so... Even the things that we put put up can be erased, you know? Just take some idiot somewhere to hit a button and the whole World Wide Web will come down. Think about it. That's why they tell you to write stuff down, people. 
make entries in your Bob, your family Bibles and stuff. When they can't find your people's birth certificates, they'll be able to use those Bibles to prove who they are and their citizenship and so on. You know what I'm saying? Start keeping up your family Bibles. Even if even if that's not your religion, I'm telling you, when you need to bring it, that's what they want to see. Or your baptismal papers or whatever like that. Keep it in a safe deposit box or in a fireproof box along with your important papers. So then something that we all need to take heed to. So anyway, fairy tales. We have to, again, we can't blame the Brothers Grimm. Those stories weren't even written for children, actually. They were written for, to entertain adults. But someone got the bright idea to turn these into children's stories. And have profited off of them. And most of the profits have gone to entities that are run by men. Usually white men. But men nonetheless. And that's why the Harry Potter series was just so phenomenal. Because here this woman who had been on public assistance in Great Britain had pulled herself up out of, you know, all of that she grew up in and did this series of books that caught the imagination of the world for children, you know. And who knows? Maybe we'll do a study and say that that messed us up somehow or messed up this generation of children somehow. And actually, when you think about it, perhaps it has affected some of the darkness, you know, the metal and... I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. Or it could have helped with their awakening, them being more open to an awakening either, even. So that's a possibility also. Just as fairy tales, as I said, they have good and bad points. But I, it just stuck out to me today that the fairy tales aren't always about just how we act in our relationships. It also can be, it can color the way we look at men in our lives, fathers in our lives, their presence, you know. They're fathers who are present, but they're not present, you know. Um, a non-participant in the relationship, so to speak, right? Where they are pay the bills, and they're here, uh, you know, maybe for parties and things like that, but on a regular day-to-day -day basis, the kids don't see them because they're working. They may have to travel distances to work. They may have to go work for long periods of time as it comes back. And then when they're home, they want to maybe spend time with the wife or they just want to be in the man cave or they got meetings and things like that. They're busy, busy, but it keeps everybody's lifestyle a certain way, right? So we don't say him has doing anything wrong. He's been a provider and, and this and that. And as long as he doesn't cheat on mama while he's on the road or away all those hours, then it's okay. Hmm. Is it really? But that's how we look at things, and then those are the the expectations we put on to men to appreciate them because of what they contribute in some cases, and don't really have much interaction with them as we would with the parent who's home all the time, all right, so we could even say it could be. Either male or female. But this just a parent who's not there a lot because their work takes them away and the other parent is there a lot. Who are you going to have more of an affinity to at the end of the day? Unless the person that they're leaving you home with is abusive or something like that. But even then. You 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 have to you have to pick a side and this is the side that's that's feeding you and keeping your clothes clean and you know they're there. They might not even to put two and two together that this person, the dad that's out there working or the parent that's out there working, is doing anything to stabilize what they have because no one's expressing that to them in any kind of appreciative way. Give them a tie in 
on Father's Day, maybe, and uh, some socks and Christmas, right? And even if that's not what goes on today, there's still a whole generation of us out here who that's that was reality. That's how we grew up. It was normal. It was normal to the point it was part of the television every time we turned on Christmas. Fathers got sweaters, ties, and socks. Maybe, maybe he would get a robe, hardly ever pajamas. And if he was a real good boy, he got a giant-sized picture of his wife. <laughs> That's basically what men got. They would get um, a red uh, Camaro or something when they were going through their, um, uh, what do you call it, midlife crisis in their 50s, late 40s, mid 50s, you know, mid to late 50s. They, you know, depend on what their energy level is and their work schedule and other events that go on around them that um, they get that midlife crisis. Just like we get um, postmenopausal, you know, menopausal and postmenopausal. It's the same thing that they get. It's just ours takes place inside and theirs takes place outside, just like anything that's masculine and feminine. Theirs is outside, ours is inside. Ours is biological, theirs is grandiose <laughs> and material, right? So keep that in mind also. When we are dealing in our relationships, be sensitive to those aspects of who we are and who, how we relate to one another. That remember, we are both masculine and feminine within our DNA, and actually, the masculine has the ability to be both male and female, right? Because they have the XY chromosomes, and we women have the XX. So, it is within them to be that. It's just that those two energies fight amongst themselves, just like they do on the outside, basically. All right, so the same way men and women fight men are from mars women are from venus right war love inside of men is that same war that's going on that same xy chromosome fighting against one another even though when they do the right thing and get together they can populate the world instead they clash so that's another thing so anybody who thought I, I, i'm not bashing men i hope no one takes it as that i'm certainly not bashing women for, I'm just making a point for us to be observant of what may be at play in our behavior. This is not to blame anybody. It's just the way our society is, and this is how we grew up. And so we can try to get a better understanding of one another and just maybe think a little deeper into these things if they haven't, you know, if it hasn't occurred to you to think about it. I'm just sharing it with you because I, Spirit led me to it and I thought it would be something that if I thought of it and I thought it was interesting and I thought it kind of made sense and maybe it would help heal someone of my <laughs> father issues or men issues, then maybe it'll help somebody else too because that's what God has given me the, these gifts for in order to share these messages. So. Um, if this, if this resonates with you in any way, um, please be sure to, um, like this, um, video and, um, if you want to make comments, feel free to please in the comment section below and please share these messages, uh, with your friends. Okay. Or your family members, uh, you know, and forgive our mothers and our stepmothers and our stepfathers and our fathers and uh, for their absences or their inability to raise themselves up to our expectations. All right? I'm not talking now about people who have been molested and that kind of stuff. That's another issue. I'm talking about abandonment not being there, not being available. And uh, those of us who've had those type of issues with our parents or parental figures, you know, left us with a parent that was not good to us, a step-parent that was not good to us, um, not 
understanding what was going on when they weren't there, you know. Uh, somehow, maybe one parent talking against the other parent. Um, they even have a charge for that now in, in child custody cases, right? Diminishing the other parent in, in front of the children or... Yeah, diminishing the parent, the other parent in front of the children. Those kind of things. Those are manipulative gestures. Um, sometimes I guess they may be defense mechanisms, but, you know, again, that's another topic. But it still doesn't make the child feel any better about the other parent, either of them. And in a way, you're asking them to pick sides, even though you don't intend to. When they overhear the arguments or they see the arguments or they, you know, back and forth, I'm leaving, I'm staying, you know, putting your father out, bring, letting them come back in, all of this back and forth, back and forth mess. What is it teaching your children and what is it teaching your sons and what is it teaching your daughters and what did it teach you when you were a child, when you saw that? So, thinking about it in terms of ourselves as parents and thinking about it also in terms of ourselves as children. Because as we want to be better parents, better lovers, better partners, better workers, better teachers, better listeners, we need to help heal that inner child. Because we can't just heal the adult because the inner child is still going to want have some attention like any child, right? So if we can get the inner child to a place where they can be secure and feel that they count, that it matters that we address these issues, then maybe they won't continue to affect our day-to-day. I say, thank you, Agron. Okay, everybody, so... That's the message, all right? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share these messages, and I'll be talking to everybody real soon. Um, thank you for letting me come to you and sharing these messages. And if you'd like a private reading, you know, you can send an email to pbtarot7 at gmail.com, or you can look at me on the Instant Go app. That's I-N-S-T-A-N-T-G-O, and that's on Apple products, iPads, and iPhones. <coughs> okay, so... I'll be talking to everybody real soon. <coughs> See, I told y'all, I'm not feeling all that great, but I wanted to get this out. So, I'll be talking to y'all soon, if not later on this evening, probably tomorrow the next day. So, I love you guys, all right? And be sweet. Namaste.